Bula Vinaka. This is Pacific Waves from RNZ Pacific. I'm Susanna Suiswiki. Coming up. So everybody agreed that it should proceed, and the National Party were part of that as well. So for me, that's a signal of commitment from them. A bill aiming to restore New Zealand citizenship for some Samoans makes progress also. We just can't keep up, and I've, I've tried to reduce numbers. I just don't see any lights uh, at the end of the tunnel. A struggling Auckland food bank will close its doors for good, and later on, how an aid project led to Bougainville's cocoa boom. A bill that aims to restore New Zealand citizenship to a group of Samoans has moved forward from the select committee with unanimous support. Green Party MP Tianao Toyono's bill, Restoring Citizenship Removed by Citizenship Act 1982 bill, received over 30,000 public submissions and support. Toyono told Caleb Fotheringham he expects all parties to support the bill through the second reading, including National, which did not back it initially. Select committee's just reported back to the House. So it's been reported back to the House. We've got unanimous support from the Select Committee for the bill to proceed, so that's good news. Around the committee, we had the National Party, New Zealand First Party, Green Party and the Labour Party. So that's a good indication that it's going to move ahead, so I'm happy about that. Uh, you know, we didn't agree on everything. Of course, we wanted to get more things in there, particularly after listening to the community who are asking for, for other things. For example, the expansion from just the original cohort to include the, 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 the children of those, immediate children of those people, which would have been about, we predict, about fifteen to 19,000. So that was supported by the Greens and Labour, so myself and the Labour Party. But that didn't get over the line. But there is support to make sure that there's something, that that pathway is there for that original cohort and a bunch of other things in the Select Committee report. But happy it's moving forward. Right, yeah, I remember that discussion around who is entitled to citizenship was quite a big one from the community if it's going to include all descendants. So just to be clear, it's just going to be the people born between 1924 to 1949. It's that original cohort. That's what we've got at the moment. We've still got a while to go. Um, So the process is first reading... Select committee submissions come in, we consider it, and I learned a bunch of things um, that I didn't know before, so that was that was good, it was enlightening for me. And then it goes back to the House for second reading, then after second reading, it'll go to the Committee of the Whole House, and more amendments can be proposed there, so if there is political will on the side of the government parties, possibly that could be something that people could look at, and then it goes to the third reading, so it, it's a process, we've still got a little bit of uh, way to go. I know it's early days, as you said, it's a process, but with having the other parties supporting the bill through the select committee process, are you feeling fairly confident that the bill will pass? Uh, Well, you know, I mean, it's a novel in politics, so far as expect the unexpected, but I'm I'm confident, I'm confident it'll get through the second reading uh, if people follow through with the with their commitments and the way that they, uh, whether they indicated within the select committee report, that is a strong indication that it will get through um, the second reading. But you know, don't count your chickens till the hatch, so they say. So you're expecting National to also support the bill through the second reading? Yeah, well, uh, the indications uh, on the select committee report was it was unanimous. So everybody. Everybody selected, everybody agreed that it should proceed, and the National Party were, were part of that as well. So there is, for me, that's a signal of commitment from them. And overall, surrounding the whole select committee process, how have you found it? It was really engaging. Uh, I think it's really important to acknowledge the role of our young people, the young people that came to the committee, the, the strength of their submissions, the way that they were connected to the issues, because these issues are they're generational. Uh, and the way that they, many of them represented uh, their parents and their grandparents, I think is something, something to note, the way that they talked about it. And, you know, because I'm, you know, I'm born in New Zealand, so I, I'm, I'm Pacifica and I'm born in New Zealand, like many of us here, uh, and that we have those connections back to the islands. But, you know, you also want to know that your parents and your grandparents have been treated with with respect and integrity here with an Aotearoa New Zealand. And that is uh, something that came through strongly with the submissions, particularly from, from young people. There are some other submissions that I found really, really strong. Uh, the Pacific Lawyers Association submission about talking about how in, in order to resolve something, it has to be meaningful, it has to be something tangible. People from the trade unions came as well, and they talked about 
when they were fundraising to support Falima Ilesa, that campaign to take it to the Privy Council, that a lot of that work was being done by uh, cleaners and workers to get that money together as well. So noting the you know the grassroots community action and connection and commitment behind the campaign back then, uh, way back in 1982, through to the petition in 2003, right through to now, I think is also something important to note. Community leader Dave Letele has confirmed her South Auckland Food Bank will shut its doors for good after Christmas. Mr Letele runs a number of programs in South and West Auckland through his business, Butterbean Motivation. But he says funding hasn't been able to match increased demand, so his food bank will have to close. Melanie Early reports. Dave Letele says he's been trying to sustain the costs of running his food bank, but he can no longer make it work. I just don't see any light uh, at the end of the tunnel. And, you know, it was, if, if I wasn't careful, it, we, it, it could bring down everything, you know, that all the other stuff we're doing too. Dave Letele says the last few years have been tough for everyone and the lower and middle class were being pushed down. He says the need is greater than ever for food banks, but the funding just isn't there. We just can't keep up and I've, I've tried to reduce numbers, but... This year, you know, we're grateful for we got, but you know, it's 87 grand we've got. Um, it's just when you when you're giving food parcels with meat, fruit, bread, milk, you know, groceries, it, that goes very very fast. Mr. Latelle says the food bank gives out parcels to about 200 families a week, and needs around one million dollars a year to run it. At its height during the COVID-19 pandemic, he was catering for up to 1,000 families a week. Over the past few years, I have to raise this money and the pressure on me mentally, it's just too much of a toll for me to handle at the moment. Um, you know, I, I just I just can't do it. Uh, you know, there's days where, you know, I mean, there's not a day goes by where I don't go to sleep thinking about it. I wake up thinking about it. How are we going to get through? Local councillor Daniel Newman says the closure of the food bank is a big loss for South Auckland. The BBM Food Bank has done a lot of really very important work to help vulnerable people in our community. This is going to cause disruption for a lot of people at a time when we need certainty in the delivery of food parcels to ensure that people have that security. Mr Newman says more pressure will be put on other food banks in the area. It will challenge the ability of those providers to be able to stretch further to meet the needs of their clients, as well as what I would expect will be the new clients that look for options following on from BBM leaving this particular space. Auckland City Missioner Helen Robinson says she's deeply distressed by the news of the closure. I can't say that I'm shocked uh, because we do understand the, the nature of funding for food relief services and how precarious they are and just how much we do need the government to step in to provide support. Dave Latelle says he will continue to help families through his gyms. The surge in cocoa prices around the world is having a dramatic impact in the autonomous Papua New Guinea region of Bougainville, and an aid project has played a key role. The world price of cocoa was up after crop failures in much of West Africa boosted other producers. For Bougainville, whose cocoa trees were old, tired and ignored by the end of the Civil War, what was needed was the lift provided by aid donors through the Bougainville Partnership. Someone involved in the partnership was academic and advisor to Pacific governments, Gordon Peck, who spoke with Don Wiseman. You're right, Bougainville's been a major beneficiary of this this world rise in, in cocoa prices. And... You know that old, that old saying, success has many parents. A large amount of credit for this must go to Bougainville's farmers, but also aid donors themselves, the World Bank, and uh, an Australian-New Zealand initiative called the Bougainville Partnership took a calculated risk way back in 2015, 2016, to decide to invest in cocoa. And all the benefits of that investment are being reaped in Bougainville over the last 12 months. What was the nature of the support? So the nature of the support was a set of largely, it had various different dimensions to it, but the major flagship or the major banner initiative of it was a set of grants that were given to cocoa farmers in Bougainville. 
Bougainville has had cocoa farmers for over a century, ever since the time of the Germans who first started planting cocoa seeds. But Australia and New Zealand and the World Bank invested in giving grants to cocoa farmers that enabled them to be able to buy seeds and you know good quality seeds that would result in in good quality cocoa seeds that could avoid the impact of the cocoa beetle that's right there's something called the cocoa borer that had just wreaked havoc upon bougainville's cocoa industry this was like a tiny little grub that spread like uh like a virus and really decimated the industry and the donors came in and they invested in these more resistant strains of cocoa seed that meant that there was less chance of it succumbing to this borer. I don't think it's 100% foolproof in any way, but it really helped strengthen the quality of Bougainville's cocoa product. And, you know, the results are being reaped in the tills of, of Buka. Bougainville is now the biggest producer of cocoa and PNG, is that right? I believe so, um, but it's a, it's certainly a large uh, producer of, of it. But I, I don't think I could swear on a Bible and tell you that it's that it's the largest producer. Tell me about the impact of all this money coming in. What's it doing? Well, I mean, you can see the impacts of this in any number of ways in in Bougainville. I mean, there's a sort of at the superficial level, you you can see that the shelves of shops in 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 Buka, the administrative mm-hmm. capital, are empty because people are buying consumer goods. There's money going into school fees, into into a building boom in in Bougainville. So you can see that there's evident signs of consumption. Cars are being bought, et cetera. And it's a kind of there's a there's a kind of mini economic boom that's going on in in Bougainville. And no doubt the government's reaping some GST tax. Well, hopefully, one of the challenges throughout Papua New Guinea, Dawn, is tax collection. Anyone that is paying tax in Bougainville will be kind of boosting the government coffers there. It's quite a complex arrangement because the money is collected by the Papua New Guinea Department of Revenue, and then it's remitted back to Bougainville as well. So I think we don't actually know how much the government coffers are being bolstered by this. One would hope by a a significant degree because Bougainville needs all the economic support that it can get as it tries to, you know, move forward on its on its aspirations to be the next independent nation in the world. It needs a viable economy. And as far as the government's been concerned, it was going to be built around the reopening of the Panguna mine. There's been talk for years about developing agriculture and horticulture and so on. Do you think this is the sort of thing that will turn a few more heads? I don't think it's going to be, you know, like, I mean, I think we probably both remember as, as children the story of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. I don't think it's the equivalent of a, like the, the silver chocolate bar that you win that get, that grants unlimited riches and unlimited wonders for this. But certainly it must help with it. As you say, Don, the, uh, the mine, there's been discussions about opening the mine For as long as I've been involved in Bougainville, as long as you've been reporting on Bougainville, that is the most likely, that is the the sort of the largest potential economic factor in in Bougainville. But this cocoa investment that Australia, New Zealand and the World Bank made is paying off presently and must surely be bolstering Bougainville's economic position, which was in a pretty rickety state for, for a long time. The government in Buka depends largely upon grants from the government in Papua New Guinea. So it depends on grants from the the place where it's trying to extricate itself from. So anything that gives an extra set of money in their own coffers is surely welcome. I mean, what I will say is that countries all over the world have really struggled our places all over the world have really struggled to kind of capitalize on these commodity booms as well. I think time will tell how well the government in Bougainville is able to capitalize upon this boom that really came out of came out of nowhere. I mean, it came out of the fact that there's been a crop failure in large parts of of West Africa, which has meant that there's less cocoa on the market, which has boosted uh, the price of of cocoa. So I think time is going to tell as to whether they are able to capitalize and compound this windfall that's come to them. So a good news story, but will the Bougainville partnership continue to make an effort here? I believe so. 
aid is always going in phases. And my understanding from, from, from looking at the issue and reporting on the issue is that Australia and New Zealand, this Bougainville partnership is continuing to invest in cocoa, continuing to invest in commodities in Bougainville. And I think that's a really I think that's a really good thing. And I think it's a, also a good thing because often it's easier to point to where there are failures in aid or where there are missteps in aid or where, where the development dollar doesn't appear to be eventuating very much. I think this is something to be celebrated and something to be remarked upon that this is a aid success story, a relatively unheralded aid success story as well, Don. That's Pacific Waves for today. I'll be stepping away from the show for a short while, but don't forget we're also on Spotify, Apple and iHeartRadio. From myself and the RNZ Pacific team, Tofa Sorifua.